It's been our very great privilege to have had John Barclay with us over the last few days and especially here for this evening's lecture. And uh, we at Alpha Crucis, I have to say, are delighted to extend a very warm welcome to all of you who've been able to join us this evening. Thank you for coming. And uh, I think we're hoping that this might be the first of many like opportunities for us to host world-class speakers for your benefit, delectation and delight, I think is the appropriate. You like that? Good. Now, uh, it's a topos, it seems to me, of academic introductions that we begin by saying that the honoured guest needs no introduction. And that's certainly the case here. But I think it's also true that this is an assertion honoured more in the breach than the observance. And I'm not about to depart from that time-honoured tradition tonight. You catch the three honoureds in there? as um, Carefully thought through, yeah. Now, um, John is, of course, the Lightfoot Professor of Divinity at Durham and he's been there since 2003. Uh, Durham, as you might know, is one of the more delightful historic northeastern cities. And its majestic cathedral not only holds relics of Cuthbert, St Oswald and the Venerable Bede, uh, its library contains three copies of the Magna Carta, but I should add its cloisters were also recently the movie home to a saint of far more modern minting, Harry of Potter. Right? So uh, if you're a fan of the movies, you've been to Durham, whether you realise it or not. Uh, on a more serious note, though, many of us are here precisely tonight because we're familiar with a number of John's groundbreaking works. Uh, I should say, I think that word is almost worn out through overuse, but not in this case. <laughs> Uh, John completed his PhD on Galatians in the early 80s at Cambridge, might I note, hence the faint patina of glory that still attends his presence. And it was later published as Obeying the Truth. Uh, I think my first encounter with your work was that essay on mirror reading and Paul's opponents. Of course, you cited Mourner, and that was important for me to note. Right? So, uh, John has since published a number of books, many more essays and book chapters, including, I think, the very helpful collection on Pauline Christians in the context of Diaspora Judaism. Now, John, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of those essays first saw the light of day in an SBL exchange between you and Tom. It was a third person, Dominic Crossan, was he involved in that? Who was the... Robert Jewett, was it? Okay, so the confusion. Um, I remember being struck by the clarity and reasonableness of your um, approach. Not only was I fully persuaded, but it's also the first time I've actually seen Tom at a loss for words, uh, or almost. And nothing against Tom, I, I'd count myself a good friend of his, but it was, this is not a, a common occurrence. <laughs> Would that be a fair assessment? I think it probably was. You wouldn't say so, of course, but uh, there you go. Um, and of course, you know, um, most recently, the, another groundbreaking volume, Paul and the Gift. Now, can I say all of this is good and very good, but uh, to be more personal here, I think what we've been graced with in these last few days is that we've recognised that John is not just concerned with careful historical exegesis or respectful attention to the history of reception or actually the recovery of a fully theological reading of the New Testament. Those things are all really good. But John, not to embarrass you, good brother, um, what's really, I think, taken most of us is that you embody what you teach. And this, in the light of the current crisis in Western universities, might be a lesson worth their remembering. They were originally founded to shape character. And John, uh, it is clear to me that you teach who you are. And sorry again, I have to say this because I think it's true. Um, that you is nothing if not found in Christ. And I thank you for that. So with all of this in view, I can't think of anyone who could better address this evening's topic. Paul, Grace and the crisis in self-identity. Is that correct? Self-worth. Self okay, good. Um, that's my mistaken redactional representation. So, John, may God's uh, life-giving graciousness be with you tonight and with us all as you speak. So please join me in welcoming John. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's good. Rick, thank you very much indeed um, for your very generous words. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. 
I've had um, two days. Is it two days? It's, it's two days here now. <laughs> I was going to say it feels like two weeks, but no, no. <laughs> yeah, I've had two very rich days here, uh, packed with uh, with uh, all kinds of engagements with uh, students and with a, and with a, a video camera, uh, uh, and um, it's been uh, a, a privilege for me. And uh, so, thank you for welcoming me here. Um, what I'm going to say tonight. Uh, somewhat deliberately crosses traditional boundaries between biblical studies, theology, and contemporary Christian practice. It's not the only way you can do or I could do biblical studies. Um, it's probably not a talk I would give at SBL, at Society of Biblical Literature, um, but I hope it's appropriate here, and it's certainly um, where my heart is. Um, so... Um, those of you who are expecting nothing other than a sort of hard-headed, hardcore historical study will find bits of that here, but other bits as well. We live in an age when crises of self-worth seem to have reached epidemic proportions. Schools, colleges, counselors, churches, health workers are all reporting a sharp and shocking rise in the number of people, especially young people, but not only them, who are experiencing a collapse in their self-esteem. Anxiety, self-doubt, and depression are rife, manifesting themselves in numerous ways, ranging from self-harm, panic attacks, eating disorders, sleep disorders, and obsessive behavior, to thoughts of suicide, and tragically, sometimes acts of suicide. I. Uh, for the last few years, I've had a partly pastoral role in, in Durham University, where I teach, which is full of high academic achievers. And I've witnessed our counselling services overwhelmed, as in every other university in the UK. I think probably this is a worldwide phenomenon. Student, with students struggling and sometimes collapsing under burdens of self-doubt and depression. It's a deeply disturbing phenomenon and there are many possible explanations. Social media may not be the cause of the problem, but it's certainly exacerbated, exacerbated it. Having one's life out there on the internet, where others can judge you and make critical comments with uncanny ease, having to project a successful self-image while watching others' lives that are apparently so much happier, all this makes one want to be liked, followed, admired, retweeted, acknowledged, noticed, and affirmed. But that in an increasingly judgmental world where affirmation could be hard to win. In our visual world, it's crucial to look good, to be visibly successful, equipped with photos of oneself, having a good time, and with a physical appearance and body shape that conform to social expectations of beauty. The combination of impossibly high expectations and fragile egos is a recipe for distress. In an age when people fear the judgment of their peers far more than they fear the judgment of God, we become increasingly petulant, critical, even cruel, and it's proving hard to take. At least God would be an impartial judge, knowledgeable and fair. Our peers can cut us down unfairly, but with devastating effect. One solution to this problem is simply to talk ourselves into self-worth. If you've ever come within the reach of a L'Oreal advert, uh, who hasn't, um, you'll know what I mean. Sorry, it's not a very good image, it's probably just as well. The same basic slogan has been used in these adverts since 1971, shifting from because I am worth it to because you're worth it, and now I think because we're worth it. But in each case, simply affirming worth without any clear basis for it. Now, I think I'm fairly resistant to such adverts. Uh, as a male academic, I don't think they're really targeted at me. <laughs> and I'm incl inclined to be a bit cynical. Is it just an accident that a potential customer's self-esteem is being bolstered at the very moment when they're encouraged to buy an expensive product? More seriously, where does this worth come from? 
is this simply a form of narcissism? What about all those for whom this apparently effortless self-love is not an option? Can I affirm my worth unless other people affirm it with me, even for me? Or is my worth, worrying thought, simply a hollow lie perpetrated by Western individualism? At a wider social level, we live in an age when the equal worth or dignity of every human being, which was once considered so obviously self-evident, is now not at all evident, but up for political contest. You may be familiar with this statement, written 240 years ago from the American Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We now marvel, I think, at the confidence of that self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident. As Stanley Hauerwas is on record as saying, it's a pity that America's founding document begins with a straightforward lie. Is it self-evident? In the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, it's noticeable that all reference to the creator and created disappear. We have simply the assertion that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. This is 1948. Now the reason there was no reference to created and created is because there was no consensus regarding the basis of this equal dignity and equal rights. It's simply asserted without any grounds. And in that, it is still true that there is no consensus. Because there is no, no consensus, it's once again increasingly easy for power, privilege and wealth, or simply national self-interest, to ensure that some lives matter more than others, and that some people's dignity can be safely ignored. If all are theoretically equal, some, as George Orwell might have said, uh, did say, are, are clearly more equal than others. One wonders how those who've been on the Manus Island and Nauru think about what that statement means. The same with the refugee crisis in Europe, I should say. We simply don't know anymore why people have worth and what constitutes worth in the first place. And in that yawning gap, it's dangerously easy for individuals and groups to invent their own standards of worth and therefore to judge others and sometimes to judge themselves as failing to meet those standards. Now, I believe that Paul's gospel has something highly significant to say and to do in this context, but that may require us to adapt some of our traditional Protestant language. Our contemporaries are not now primarily trying to win the favor of God. They're trying to win the favor of one another. The judgment they fear is not the last judgment, but the humiliating comments on social media. What is the good news in this situation? To speak with the reformer, Protestant reformers of works righteousness and the effort to find a gracious God does not seem fully adequate anymore. If they think about God, most of our contemporaries are likely to assume that God is gracious in a kind, in a kind of kindly grandfather sort of way generally benign and well-intentioned towards us, but they don't find their sufficient assurance that this guarantees their worth. The issue is also not just about works. People are anxious about achievement, but they're also anxious about other elements of worth that are nothing to do with works or the achievement of righteousness. They feel shamed by their ethnicity, by their body shape, their physical limitations, their psychological weaknesses and not just by their failure to meet high standards of moral or social success. Now I want to argue here that Paul's theology of grace offers rich resources with which to address this crisis in worth. 
And my language of worth is designed to reach wider than the traditional focus on works. I want to demonstrate first how Paul's announcement of the gift of God in Christ, the definitive divine gift that was given without regard to worth, created the conditions for new and innovative communities in which the traditional criteria of worth could be downplayed or even ignored because they were not the criteria by which God had acted in Christ. What's at stake here is not only success in meeting agreed criteria of worth, but the very criteria themselves, which the gospel exposes as human-based, culturally determined, and of no ultimate significance before God. I'll then briefly survey how Luther recontextualized this Pauline message of grace in the context of the 16th century church, before coming back to our own contemporary context and asking how Paul's theology and practice might inspire our own contextualization of the gospel in our new secularizing context with its accompanying crises of worth. Paul's theology was developed in the context of mission, in the formation of new communities whose allegiance to Christ set them at an angle to their previous social commitments and their prior evaluations of worth. Paul's gospel announces God's decisive intervention in the death and resurrection, in the, in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ to reconcile and remake the world. And the mode of that action is gift or grace. Most gifts in antiquity, human or divine, were given in proportion to worth. Even if they were given lavishly, they were given to fitting recipients. Otherwise, they seemed arbitrary or unfair. Paul, however, announces the definitive divine gift in Christ, given not to God's friends, but to God's enemies. Not to the righteous, but to the unrighteous. Not to the godly, but to the ungodly. An unfitting or incongruous gift that scrambles our understanding of God and of the world. And what is scrambled here are the very criteria by which justice is measured. The cutting edge of Paul's mission was the movement of the Christ gift and the accompanying gift of the Spirit into the Gentile, the non-Jewish world. This was his calling as apostle and this was his success in establishing churches that crossed the age-old ethnic divide between Gentiles and Jews uniting both on the basis of their common welcome by Christ. For Jews like Paul to accept that God's grace would extend to idolatrous and sinful Gentiles was one thing, but it was another to accept that this grace should recalibrate the very criteria of value that he and his fellow Jews had previously assumed. Before... He had assumed, and his opponents still assumed, that circumcision was the mark of the covenant and that it mattered greatly that any Gentile man who wished to join God's people had to be circumcised. It was the symbol of, symbolic, it was the symbol of worth. But Paul discovered that Gentile men were called and blessed without taking on the mark of circumcision. The spirit was fully operative even among uncircumcised converts. Was this a temporary aberration? No, Paul insists. God's grace is given without regard to prior worth, without regard to the apparent, but now clearly only apparent, inferior ethnicity of the Gentiles. Without regard to that mark of Jewish identity that he had previously assumed to be a sine qua non. At Antioch, Peter and the other Jewish believers began to eat with Gentiles who were not circumcised, and in so doing, apparently relaxed some of the previous rules that had separated worthy Jews from unworthy Gentiles. But he then withdrew, under pressure from certain people from James, and Paul is furious. When I saw that they were not walking in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, that's Peter, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, how can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? What was at stake for Paul was not just social etiquette, or rude behavior. What was at stake was what he calls here the truth of the gospel. How so? To reinstate old criteria of worth, the ethnic differential, 
would be to deny the gift of the gospel, which is gift in the sense of grace only as it dissolves those previous criteria. We can watch the same pattern of thought in his rebuke of the Corinthians. In this socially mixed congregation, those with superior social status were inclined to bring their old criteria of worth into their evaluation of Paul and of the church. Apollos was apparently a better speaker than Paul. He had that polish and eloquence that derives from a superior education. Some people wanted to belong to Apollos. Common meals should, they thought, as usual, display the difference in value between the wealthy and the poor. Some members of the body were simply more important than others, more powerful, more impressive, more gifted in ways that would impress Corinthian society. And again, Paul is furious. Has not the cross undercut these criteria of wisdom and power? Has it not scrambled all those human evaluations of worth in which people take pride in their ancestry, their social influence, and their education? Consider your call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards, not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing the things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. It's a wonderful statement of deconstruction, isn't it? Fantastic uh, statement of let's deconstruct all of these criteria. Note that the boasting here <coughs> is not just boasting an achievement. Having noble birth is not an achievement. It's boasting or pride in standing high on the spectrum of status that determines worth in the ancient world. And here's the classic criteria of worth. All of this, says Paul, has been undercut by the cross of Christ and by the calling in grace that issues from it. Your only worth, he tells them, though it's the worth that counts for everything, is to be found in Christ. God is the source of your life in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that, as it's written, let the one who boasts, boasts of the Lord. It's as if he's telling the Corinthians to tot up all the things that gave them worth in human terms and put a line through it. Not because he wants to crush them, but because these count for nothing in comparison to the one thing that counts for everything, the worth that you are given through participation in Christ. So we see here Paul's theology of grace redefine the values of Gentile converts who learn to rethink everything they thought important from a newly granted sense of value and significance in Christ. And of course the same is true of Paul himself, the Jewish believer, whose calling or conversion brings into question his own criteria of worth. Once he persecuted the church, excelling in all the virtues of his ancestral tradition, being far above his contemporaries, and as high up the scale of status as defined within his culture as it was possible to go. And then he was encountered by Christ and speaks of his calling in grace in exactly the same vocabulary as he'd just spoken of his Gentile converts calling in grace. Despite the fact that he'd been persecuting the church of God, this calling in grace did not take account of that negative worth. And since he was called, he says, before he was born, this calling clearly did not take account either of his apparently positive worth. In other words, Paul's own experience and the experience of his Gentile mission matched exactly what he'd learned of the gospel, that Christ died for all, both the apparently godly and the ungodly and that his grace was not conditioned by prior, condition, by prior criteria of worth. Now Philippians 3, in Philippians 3, Paul gives us perhaps his sharpest expression of what this revaluation looks like. Here he lists his cultural credentials, what a sociologist would call his symbolic capital, the things that made him worthy within his social or cultural domain. 
Do you know what I mean by symbolic capital? I mean, literal capital is the money you have in your wallet. Your symbolic capital is, is, the, is what gives you worth. And as Pierre Bourdieu and others would say, that will differ in different spheres of life. Yeah. Your symbolic capital might be your brilliant violinist or your superb dancer. Um, I'm, mine is not that I'm a superb dancer. Uh, uh, every, I have certain symbolic capital in my own in my own sphere, but it's what, as it were, puts you in that uh, in, in uh, gives you worth within that that that, that field. Here's Paul's symbolic capital. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Note that some of these are matters of achievement, Pharisaic accuracy, law observance, but some are about status, which is derived from birth or upbringing. Circumcised on the eighth day, I don't think any eight-year-old little boy boasts in the achievement of circumcision. <laughs> I don't think an eight 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 day old. Did I say eight? Yeah, I mean eight eight day old. Uh, uh, I, I I don't think they boast in achieving circumcision, but they might well take it as a sign of cultural superiority that they were brought up in a proper Jewish way. Whether ascribed or achieved, these elements of worth are all Paul declares undercut by the one thing that truly gives him worth, which is being found in Christ Jesus. By comparison, all these other tokens of worth became worthless. It's like a currency that's been abolished and no longer bears any value. At best, they become what Stoics, ancient Stoics would call things indifferent, adiaphora. Things that might be useful if they serve the purpose of the real good, but are not good in the full sense in and of themselves. Um, little aside here, you may know how the Stoics said, there is only one good, which is virtue. Health or wealth might in some circumstances be beneficial, but you can be virtuous even if you're sick or poor. In other words, those are not the real good. They are what they called adiaphora, things indifferent. Might be preferred adiaphora, but they're not. But they're not the real good. And I think Paul's doing something very, very similar. He is recalibrating what counts as the real good. It's not. It's not evil to be a Jew or to be circumcised on the eighth day, and he says if you're circumcised, you don't have to remove the mark of circumcision. It's not. It's not like a negative thing. But it's not the good. In the sense of the one thing that, in and of itself, is a necessary and sufficient for, 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 for the good, which, which in his case is um, being found in Christ. I think this helps us understand that famous antithesis between works of the law and faith in Jesus Christ. And I still think that phrase, those of you who know the debate about pistis Christu, I still think it means faith in Christ, not the faithfulness of Christ. Following on from the Antioch dispute, Paul reminds Peter that although they are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. They've discovered that a person is justified by God, not via works of the law, but through faith in Christ. The works of the law here I take to mean the observance of the Jewish law, the law of Moses. And Paul's point is that God does not declare someone righteous that is fit to stand before God on those grounds. The issue is not just the achievement of those works of the law, that is, whether humans are capable to keep the law, it's also that the law itself is no longer the criterion of righteousness in the age of Christ. If I build up again what I've destroyed, what I've torn down, then I demonstrate that I'm a transgressor, for through the law I have died to the law that I might live to God. If righteousness were defined in terms of the Mosaic law, then Christ died in vain and that would be to reject the grace of God, which has been given without regard to law observance, and in a way that undercuts the value of even blameless observance of the law. The law is simply no longer the determinative criterion of worth, although that neither is there positive worth in speaking or acting against it. As Paul puts the matter, 
neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith working through love. The phrase he uses there, tiiskue in Greek, is a financial metaphor. It means what counts, what, what, what is of worth. Faith counts, of course, not because it's a superior spiritual attitude or some higher innate capacity in the human subject, but because it is faith or trust in Christ. I don't think Paul's interested in faith as such. He's interested in faith in Christ. Now here I'm going to quote myself. Oops, I'm going back. Faith is not an alternative human achievement, but a declaration of bankruptcy. A radical and shattering recognition that the only capital, to use that metaphor, the only capital that counts in God's economy is the gift of Christ crucified and risen. Faith directed to and centered on Christ recognizes under the impact of the good news that there is no element of value locatable in the human being. It invests everything in the only capital that counts, Christ. Now it's important to get this right. Paul does not appeal, as New Testament scholar Krista uh, Stendhal once claimed, he's not appealing to, quote unquote, the equal rights of Gentiles as if he had discovered some inherent human dignity that he'd previously ignored. All right? This is a bit shocking to us, but he doesn't go around and say, I believe in equal human rights, and therefore the Gentiles have as much rights as Jews. His radical understanding of worth is not, I think, even based on being in the image of God, and we could debate that. But Paul himself only uses that phrase of human beings once, Otherwise, is, otherwise, he uses image language only of Christ. And although, although a lot has sometimes been made of the motif of image of God in Christian ethics, I doubt myself it can bear the weight that's often been placed on it. For Paul, what matters is the worth that has been accorded, given, attributed by God, by the fact that Christ died for all. In other words, I think if you ask Paul what gay people worth, he would not say, well, because they're in the image of God. He would say, because Christ died for them. Now, we might want to connect up those themes eventually, theologically, but I think it's a different way you start. Human worth, paradoxically, is the worth of the gift of Christ given without regard to our human criteria of worth. If our worth and our identity is given by God through liberation, adoption, and justification, this has the effect of dissolving the value of the other ways in which we measure our worth, rendering them no longer salient or significant. The old taken for granted systems of value are here undercut. Former taxonomies of worth cease to be relevant. This is what makes it possible to create new communities in which there's neither Jew nor Greek neither slave nor free, no male and female. Experimental communities which subvert old hierarchies of value. Everyone in the ancient world thought that free people were worth more than slaves. All Jews thought Jews were worth more than Gentiles. And everyone thought men were worth more than women. So these are hierarchies of difference, of worth that Paul's referring to. Ex th but these experimental communities subvert old hierarchies of value and create new possibilities of mutual enhancement. In these communities, far from the old jostling for position according to criteria of human worth, there is a new anti-competitive spirit in which each is able to contribute to the other from the security of knowing that their worth is underwritten by the love of God in Christ a worth that is unaffected by their social status or popularity, by their wealth or success, by their ethnicity or gender. Throughout his letters, Paul is thus able to undercut the contest culture that ruled his honor-obsessed society, giving value not to being the best, but to humility and service to others because his communities were not founded on the normal values of competitive worth. 
Being called in grace and being found in Christ was all the worth that counted and the worth that counted for everything. Part of what Paul means by freedom is this liberation from human criteria of worth. Now I want to speak briefly, secondly, about Luther. Partly because we've only just had the 500th anniversary of the Luther year, but also because Luther's reading of Paul has been roundly dismissed by many leading Pauline scholars as if it were a complete misunderstanding of Paul, but not, I think, for good reason. Luther was, of course, concerned, as all Christian preachers should be, in ensuring that the gospel is good news, not only in the text, but in life. And that meant Luther communicated Paul's message of grace in conditions well beyond Paul's own mission context and beyond the establishment of new boundary-crossing communities. Luther drew on the way that some New Testament passages generalize the works of the law into a wider category of works and on the way that Augustine had identified in Paul a predominant concern with sin as pride, with sin as pride. And Luther brought Paul's letters to bear on his own very different context with his anxious concern to win enough merit for oneself or for the deceased to gain the favor of God. Luther rediscovered the Pauline message of the unconditioned gift in Christ. As he rightly saw, faith in Paul is about receiving this gift as gift in a trust that relies wholly and only on Christ and not on our own capacities or achievements. The incongruity of this gift, its mismatch with the condition of the recipient, is the hallmark of Luther's theology. I think this captures the essential feature in Paul's theology of grace superbly well. Following Augustine and matching the needs of his own context, Luther's concern with works focused less on the content of those works, not even much on the agency of who is doing the working, but primarily on the meaning of those works as necessary for salvation. What matters for Luther is the self-understanding operative in the performance of good works which has at least three components. First, these works are understood as the necessary means to salvation, what he calls a false opinion, when in fact our salvation is already given complete and entire in Christ. Second, they're performed with what he thought uh, was an irreligious and self-regarding motivation in order to obtain salvation, thus to be gain benefit for ourselves. And thirdly, they're performed in a spirit of presumption or trust in our own righteousness an idolatrous confidence in ourselves rather than in God. Or, as the kind of correlative characteristic of this bipolar condition, out of anxiety, fear, or doubt. Paul thought, um, Luther thought that we're all in, in sort of kind of bipolar. At one moment, we're full of confidence and pride in ourselves. And the next moment, we're full of despair and anxi anxiety, and fear, and doubt. I think Luther himself was possibly a bit bipolar, uh, but I certainly think he had a very interesting analysis of the, of the human condition in that, in that respect. The primary focus here is on attainment or achievement rather than the criteria of worth themselves. To some extent, Luther did question the ways that certain forms of piety, like chastity and voluntary poverty, had been given superior value. Of course, he re-evaluated family life and ordinary civic duty in a way that changed the, the value systems of, 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 of the Middle Ages. But he was working, Luther was working, of course, within a Christianized society. He's not working like Paul in a pagan society with its non-Christian norms. So as I read him, Luther's prior concern was not with whether the good works you were doing, being urged to do, were really good, but with whether in doing those good works you were laboring under the false impression that you had to do them to make yourself acceptable to God. Okay, so where I see Paul as, as challenging the whole criteria, what makes a good work good, and is this genuinely the good, I think Luther is operating at a slightly different level. 
One way to understand Luther in relation to Paul is to say that Luther developed Paul's mission theology, which was designed to create new communities of converts. He developed it into a kind of inward mission, into the life of the church itself, even into the heart of every believer. The language of grace that had once served in Paul to detach new communities from their previous non-Christian cultural allegiances was now applied by Luther to believers who had little or, or no consciousness for break with their past. They'd been brought up as Christians from the very beginning, baptized as infants, but who existed in, and who existed in a solidly Christian culture. Luther recaptured the incongruity of grace in Paul and its origin in the event of Jesus Christ, and he applied this subversive dynamic to the life of the church itself. His target was now not the old normative systems that believers were struggling to shed, as was Paul's target, but believers' faulty understanding of their own good works as necessary to, to gain God's favor. Paul's theology, in other words, is re-preached by Luther to effect the perpetual conversion of believers. Now, Luther was very clear that you, you have to go back to square one every day. Every day. They need to learn, believers need to learn over and again to receive the gift of God and to banish the false opinion that their works will merit salvation. So you see, he's sort of turning Paul's conversion theology about converting pagans into Christians and then re-evaluating re everything. He's turning that into a kind of inward mission. The gospel needs to be preached to every Christian every day. Um, it's fascinating. The gospel constitutes a mission to the self and a daily return to baptism since the old nature persists in its tendency towards arrogant self-sufficiency. It must be constantly corrected by reminders that Christ has already given all. So the grace that Luther talks about scores a line, not so much between the community and the non-Christian world, but right through as it were the life of a believer who he famously describes as at the same time justified and a sinner justified only as the believer relies entirely on the unconditioned gift of Christ. So there is a kind of perfect incongruity, a lifelong mismatch between the gift of God and the worth of the believer. Christ's righteousness is our own only as we are joined to him by faith. It's never infused, it remains perpetually other. This was a crucial and I think brilliantly effective way of transposing Paul's theology of grace into the needs and conditions of the 16th century church. Interestingly, many Catholics today, even the current Pope, recognize Luther's work as providing an essential corrective to the medieval church. And countless are the lives of ordinary believers who have discovered through Luther's influence the liberating power of grace. But the question is this, what does it mean to preach this same gospel today in conditions, I think, utterly different from those of Luther 500 years ago? In answering this question, here's my, here's my final section, the, the gospel of grace in the contemporary crisis of worth. In answering this question, I actually want to start from Luther. Um, and I want to rethink what, what he says here. This is, this is a text that dates, this is 500 years old now, okay, 1518. Um, we're in the 500th anniversary of the Heidelberg um, Disputation. One, if you've never read it, it's, it's extraordinary. The final thesis, anybody come across this before? The final thesis, the, the thesis 28 of the Heidelberg Disputation, okay. The love of God, here's the thesis, the love of God does not find, but create what is pleasing to it. Human love comes into being through what is pleasing to it. Now the point of the contrast is this. Human love is generally love by attraction. We're drawn to something good, beautiful or useful, something which is already present in the object or person to which we're drawn. There's something there that I like and I'm drawn to it. We cannot love something which is not present, and we turn away from what seems to us evil or ugly because they're unattractive to us. 
What repels or attracts is, of course, dependent on our standards of value. We love what we count as worthy of our love. By contrast, Luther insists, on the basis of the gospel, but against the whole philosophical tradition up to this point, he's having a dig at, um, at Aristotle all the way through this, this disputation, but I contrast, the love of God does not find something pleasing to it, which draws God's love towards it, rather it creates, that's the distinction, find and create. It creates what is pleasing and good. It confers it, fashions it out of nothing. Luther himself comments on this. Therefore sinners are attractive to God because they are loved. They're not loved because they're attractive. It's interesting, isn't it? No. This is the love of the cross, born of the cross, which turns in the direction where it does not find good which it may enjoy, but where it may confer good on the bad and needy person. Grace, in other words, is unconditioned. It does not depend on human accounts of worth. It gives worth, the only worth that counts, which is the worth of being loved by God. Now, drawing on Paul and inspired by Luther, I think we have some really rich resources here with which to address our contemporary crisis of worth. I wish there were more theologians addressing this. Maybe I've missed them, but it's about time we woke up to the fact that we, we're living in a new age of crisis and, and about time we talked about it. As you may know, one of the contemporary gurus who's attempting to address these crises on a personal level um, 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 is someone um, called, um, called uh, um, uh, uh, Brené Brown. Anybody come across Brené Brown? Whose TED Talks and books have become very popular in the States. Are they popular here in Australia? Okay, yeah. In reaction against the impossible demands of, um, um, of, uh, of perfectionism, Brene Brown advocates honesty about one's faults and weaknesses, a form of author or authenticity, what she calls leaning in to your own vulnerability. She assures her readers that you are imperfect you're wired for struggle, but you are worthy of love and belonging. Now, I think, actually, Brene Brown has some Christian uh, convictions underlying all this, but she doesn't bring that to the surface. It's not at all clear where this worth is meant to come from. Okay, here's one of her books, The Gifts of Imperfection. Subtitle, Let Go of Who You Think You Are, are Supposed to Be, and Embrace Who You Are. But what if who you are is judged in human terms as less than worthy of admiration or love? And what if who you are simply crumbles under your own embrace? As happens for many of the young, be young people I was talking about at the beginning. I'm not sure it helps them very much to embrace themselves because that's precisely they don't feel they can. This is where the announcement and the enactment of an unconditioned gift, established and undergirded in Christ without regard to worth, that's where this is really good news. In this case, your worth is not derived from other people's acceptance of you or even from self-acceptance, which can be deceptive and fragile. Your worth is derived from a gift, something given to you, that because it's given to you from God is absolutely genuine and secure. I think the story of grace in Paul, which I outlined earlier, gives us the resources to address this issue at two levels. First place, it deals with our failures, our human propensity to muck things up, our failure to live up to our own standards, let alone others as we need to be constantly assured Christ died for the ungodly. But secondly, it enables us to sit loose to those very human judgments of worth by which we apportion ourselves or others into categories or hierarchies of worth. 
As we've seen, what Paul talks about is not just the false pride we take in our works and attainment, but also the false pride we take in those very human marks of quality by which we measure each other's worth. In Christ, ethnicity, race, skin color, language, family ancestry do not matter. They do not measure our worth because they don't matter to the God of grace. In Christ, your body's abilities or disabilities weaknesses or strengths, size or shape, conformity or non-conformity to the standards of worth regnant in our culture, do not matter. They do not matter, they do not measure your worth because they don't matter to the grace of God. In Christ, your sporting success or your education grades, your wealth or popularity do not matter one bit. You're given the only worth that counts by the grace of God. I had a fascinating conversation with uh, uh, someone who's a chaplain to American um, sports athletes and how, because um, their worth is so bound up in success, um, if they come second or third, complete disaster to their whole self-esteem is crushed because everything hinges on, on coming first. That's, that's who they are. Now, all of that is easier to to say than to believe, and it's easier to declare than to practice. I'm reminded of the response of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, when he found out recently through a paternity test that the person he'd thought all his life was his father was actually not, as his mother had had a fling with another man just before marrying his father. That's the kind of news that would unsettle a lot of people. But his response was clear, is what he said. Although there are elements of sadness and even tragedy in my father's case, this is a story of redemption and hope from a place of tumultuous difficulty and near despair in several lives. I find who I am in Jesus Christ, not in genetics. And my identity in him never changes. Isn't that an interesting comment, isn't that? Everyone thought he'd be terribly ashamed and terribly upset that he didn't you know that his genetic and identity was not what he was, and he'd been born in a slightly shady way. So that's, that's not who I am. So what? Um, that was a bold, but I think a truly Christian thing to say. A few years ago, a friend of mine and I sat down to list all the things that we valued most about ourselves and where, if we lost them, we would find most difficulty in our self-worth. We were both academics, so we were kind of thinking this. So what if I had a stroke and couldn't speak? What if I had a brain injury and could no longer teach or write? What if I lost my job or my reputation was trashed? Could I then hold on to the fact that I am who, whom I am and I'm worth what I'm worth, not because of my innate skills or achievements, but because I'm loved unconditionally by God? Or is my dignity and self-worth subtly founded on something other than the grace of God in Christ? That was a very sober, I encourage you to do that someday. <laughs> it's a very, it was a very sobering and in some ways a very liberating experience. Paul, as we've seen, worked out his theology of grace in the context of mission, where new communities were rubbing up against their ambient cultures and setting up social experiments called churches, whose value systems were set to a different tune. It was only in these communities where alternative systems of worth were applied and practiced that it was possible for the message of grace to take real effect. Since worth is always, always as much about how people treat you as about how you see yourself, the early Christian believers needed communities that crossed ethnic boundaries and ate together without discrimination to know that it really was the case that in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek. They need to keep eating together in, in ways that it ignored their ethnic difference to really rub it, really, really rub it into their consciousness that ethnic difference didn't matter. They needed communities which were blind to differences in social or legal status to know that it really was the case that in Christ there's neither slave nor free. Saying this is one thing, but doing it is another, which is why it really matters to have churches mixed in ethnicity and social status hard as that is to practice. 
If the Christians that we mix with are all like ourselves, this is the classic case in Britain at least, middle class churches, everybody of the same kind, we get the impression that being like us, with our attributes and cultural values, is really what it is to be a Christian. We need Christians, in other words, of a very different kind who speak and act very differently from us to jolt us out of our cultural captivities. Because only so can we be reminded, as was Paul, that grace is not conditioned by our social values. Now, as I was saying to some people last night, I belong to a very small Anglican church in a former mining village outside Durham where there are people of very different age, background, and social status worshipping together including some from a local home for adults with severe learning difficulties. It's when we go together to the communion rail and receive together the gift of God in Christ that I remember again most fully who I am. Not a university professor, because at that critical moment, that doesn't matter at all. But a child of God, just like everyone else, by grace alone. All my cultural prejudices um, I've got them, um, about accent, educational ability, even about stupid things like tattoos and body piercings. All of these fall away or should fall away at that moment because that's the moment where I'm most truly myself. It's there that God embraces who I am, strips me down as it were and re-establishes me again in Christ. That's why there's no, import, no moment more important to me than that. Now we're reaching a time in the West when mission in a non-Christian environment is again the primary task of the church. And that's a time when the gap between the gospel and human judgments of worth will become evident again. The good news is once again liberating in this sense, redeeming people from the false assumptions that if they're not good enough on some empty reckoning of human success or some cultural token of worth, that they are literally worthless. The Christian good news is not embrace who you are, but be embraced by the unconditioned grace of God. But as we all know, saying this is one thing and living it is another. I finish with this striking, uh, striking interview I heard on the BBC recently that made this point very well. The subject of the interview was a Christian woman from Brixton, which is one of the poorest parts of London, whose son started getting involved with drugs via a local gang. She had the courage to counteract this trend by letting his friends use her sitting room in her flat as a place of welcome and safety, provided they didn't bring in drugs. Over time, the influence of her hospitality and her self-evident love for these kids were so powerful as to cause them to dissolve the gang and to renounce both drugs and violence. Much to the amazement of the BBC interviewer, who you could see completely flummoxed by this, she had done much more to improve conditions on her housing estate by her Christian faith than any government scheme to date. Her son made an interesting comment. She didn't show me the scriptures, he said, but she showed me love. Now, it was the scriptures, of course, that motivated and directed her love. But the fact is that words mean very little unless they take flesh, become action. That's why what mattered to Paul was not what Peter said, but what he did at meal tables in Antioch. That's why what the Corinthians did at the Lord's Supper mattered. We can all have the right words, but if the actions of our church say that racial difference or social difference really does matter, that Christianity doesn't really belong to people who are not like us, then we fail to communicate what grace is about. It's a hard and costly thing to show people that they have worth in Christ and not just to tell them that. But the fact is that the amazing grace of God in Jesus Christ, not only in John Newton's words, saved a wretch like me, it also boiled down all my assumptions about what gives me or other people worth in order to give me the only worth that counts in Christ. To communicate that in a generation caught in the crossfire of a cruelly judgmental world and struggling from loss of self-esteem would be to render the good news good indeed. Thanks very much.